third panel is uh, titled Border Walls and Resistance, uh, and I have the pleasure to chair uh, this panel as well. Um, so just a quick reminder, we've reminded it uh, a couple times today, but everyone has 10 minutes to present their papers. Uh, I will have the cards to inform you when you have five, three, one, and zero minutes left. Uh, so if you can look my way one or two times during your talk, that would be ideal. Um, once everyone has presented, we will have a Q&A as well. And as always, please speak in the microphone so that when we record sound, it, uh, it's recorded accordingly. Uh, so on this uh, last panel for day one, we have uh, four presentations. So there's a slight change to the program. Unfortunately, one participant was not able to join us due to border restrictions and visa uh, in Canada. So uh, unfortunately, we uh, will not hear his presentation, but we'll have nonetheless four very interesting presentations. So we'll start with Brenda Ceniceros, who co-wrote a paper with Carlos del Rosal Caraveo, who is not with us today. Uh, she'll present the border and art as resistance, the border wall as a canvas for art act artivist, sorry, manifestations followed by uh, Erin Oxtra, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, uh, who will present Insurgent humanitarian, Humanitarianism in the US-Mexico borderlands. Uh, thirdly, we will uh, hear from Anne-Laure Hamilatzahi and Aude Emilie Judaïc, who will present Exploring Borders, a critical insight into the critical displaying of the border spectacle. And lastly, uh, we will hear from Gary Fields, uh, for his presentation called Incarcerated Voices and Images from Confinement Landscapes in Palestine. So without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor to Brenda Ceniceros. Bonjour, buenas tardes, good afternoon, how are you? Uh, good evening, it's an honor for me to be here with you to talk about the Juarez borderland. Thank you so much to the committee and all the people that made this event possible. The main, the main topic for this presentation is the border and the idea of resistance. We can begin explaining how we understand the concept of border or borderland, which is uh, a little far away from the commonplace of social or economic analysis. The border in this investigation is associated with the architectonical and anthropological vision of the concept. The border space, the borderland, is more than a geopolitical concept and it's more than uh, a notion of a symbolic place full of signs, symbols, meanings, identities that are visually manifested. So, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, and El Paso, Texas share a mutual territory and region of the borderland almost 51 kilometers long, a complex and multicultural place of humanity, mobilization, and exchange. One of the most important migration ports between Mexico and the United States. On the first image, we can see a few natural places of the Bravo River on the borderline, demarked by a water body outlined. Once upon a time, the Bravo was strong and unfeatable. This is the wall, some graffiti, and the artistic intervention of racing borders by Ana Teresa Fernandez. The next one shows the new wall commissioned by George Bush on 2006, arriving at Juarez in 2008. Another important place are the areas of international legal crossing, because on these places there are numerous substantial social and art manifestations. Here, the river flows through an artificial concrete canal below the El Paso del Norte Bridge, an historical and political meaningful place. For all this characteristic, the border is a symbolic, meaningful place appropriated to social, political, and art manifestation. This urban space is a witness of multiple exchanges and unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable sorry, shared stories. The borderland can be viewed, read, round, and interpreted from different approaches. Uh, the border is for and of the people that live, inhabit, survive, cross this particular region, region to border is all the people that we can see it. So through a historical and anthropolog uh, anthropological visual analysis, we found cultural, political, and artistic interconnection. 
The borderland has multiple representations and narrative that speaks about the construction of a place of resistance. For the visual and semiotic analysis, we use ethnographic tour field, field trips, visual photographic documentation. Sorry. So we have the documentation of 11 ethnographical field trips of the borderland territory, the borderland. Uh, landmarks, we did the classification and categorization of the different manifestations we found. And we divide the manifestations in two groups, the art and the sociopolitical. On the category of our manifestation, we can find monuments, urban sculptures, urban art, mur murals, graffiti, uh, stencils, performance and art installation. On the category of sociopolitical manifestation, we found protests, rallies, bridge closures, cultural and political encounters. The two categories can be ephemeral or not. In total, we registered 62 art manifestations and 28 sociopolitical between the period of time of the year 2008 and 2018. The image of the art manifestation on the border, I have a rebel in force when speaking of territorial appropriation. The changing space is moving with time and living tracks, traceable and other are ephemeral mutant apalimses on the border. The image speak to us and we can interpret them as a text. So we approach the idea of the border as a meiotic visual analysis from a different perspective that focuses on the manifestation that create this place. This analysis gathers signs, symbols and meanings that are represented on the different types of manifestation that we show, how, and how this representation connects the border concept as a structure, framework, but also as an object of art that can be translated. So, we, the Berlin Wall Mural was created by the urban artist George Colectivo Resiste on 2015. The piece of was the Bravo River Canal below the Paso del Norte Bridge and has the message of a metaphor of the Berlin Wall. It speaks about the idea of resistance of the border itself, physical and symbolically, and about the transborder exchanges that the urban artists uh, do in both sides of the international borderline. I'm sorry, mother, is a mural that presents a migrant person writing to his mother and asking for her forgiveness. The principal symbol that connects to the Juarez border is, the mainly, is mainly the area code 656 tattooed on his knuckles. knuckles. The identity signs are on the other tattoos, like the phrase, I'm sorry, mother, for, for my crazy life, that speaks about the life of violence inside the gangs of young people that survive the streets of Juarez. Also the idea of the crossing, the belonging of the returning home someday, Jefita, mother, can refer to the maternal or religion figure of the great mother. Through all the canal, we can find urban art manifestations that talk about the ideas of resistance, violence, memory, and border identities, and some of them are memorials. This I will die there at the edge of the river is a mural that talks about the idea of migra migration and violence of the crossing paths and, and experience. And the quote, the song of the Juarense musical group, The Silvers. This one is very... Your, for, the, your fruit prints became the road. This is an art installation by the artist Betsame Romero. They were a uh, hundred two trees and white flags that speaks about the traces, footprints that migrant people can live on the ground together with the wounds and blood on the way of the, for the American dream. They are also social graffiti like this, hook me up, the black, beach, the black bridge like a symbol of migration and politics with the graffiti, no borders. Um, this also, this this is the installation by Enrique Hesic. I will back as millions. It talks about the historical memory where the text travel as a migrant itself. An, Amer an Argentinian phrase of Eva Perón is appropriated for the artist and transported to the border, transforming in a new model for the migration and resistance movement. This one is the Coyote. 
the figure of the person that transport people illegally to the other side of the border literally represents as a coyote, the animal with some signs of identity like the Mexican boots, the Mexican candies, a passport suite, and magic, magic dust. The symbols of decadence, tiredness, thirst of the travel, like a prostitute itself to the illegal interchanges and cultural and economic acceptance of the symbol. This one is the entrance, uh, the umbral entrance of the Paso del Norte. Um, it has uh, historical remarks, but also has this non-monument, uh, the nail cross representing the violence resisted for the feminized, feminicide murders and disappearance. The walls also is a symbol of resistance, performance artists and urban actions talks about the exchanges in these binational and sister cities, Juarez El Paso. The phrase, not delinquents, not illegal, just international workers, describes the feelings of rejection and the resistance at the border. On the other side, the wall also is transformed into a big canvas to exhibit art, becoming an, in, an entity for documentation and historical relevance. And there are two most recent installation, the first one is Border Turner by the artist Rafael Lozano, an interactive technological piece that speaks about the steady connection on the border like the power of light. It speaks about the resistance of the wall created by a bridge of light that goes to the sky, uh, the sky that all the people share. And the total, total wall by the artist Ronald Rael also speak about the resistance, a different way to see the wall. The division then turns into a traditional children games where one of the people or Nisha or international line can connect. Conclusion. The idea of semiotics and the border has taken us into a new perspective for analysis and this phenomenon to the image of a manifestation that arises in the place. The border is an object, of, an object of art, a mobile and living entity that positions itself as a body of movement which expresses, speaks, writes, and transcribes the idea of resistance, appears as a palaces full of manifestation, political art, and action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. So we will... Uh, Go with the second uh, speaker, Erin Hoekstra. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Erin Hoekstra. I'm talking to you today about my work from the borderlands and beyond in the state of Arizona. Um, and I'm speaking to you about insurgent humanitarianism. And what I'm not talking about is the kind of militarized co-optation of humanitarianism by vigilantes and the border patrol, but more talking about the use of humanitarianism as both a discourse and a field of action, a weapon or a shield, if you will, by a group, a growing kind of movement for migrant health justice in the U.S. When we think about the ways that the border moves, um, many of you may be familiar with this map and migration and border studies scholars, some of you in this room, talk about the internalization of the border. And so this orange perimeter marks the 100 mile internal perimeter of the land and sea borders of the U.S. through in which Border Patrol has claimed its jurisdiction. Two thirds of the U.S. Uh, population lives within this orange line. When we think about the border and the borderlands, we often uh, are conjured with images of this, but perhaps not images of this. My research is looking at the growing collusion between uh, Border Patrol, immigration enforcement, and spaces of health across the U.S. We don't think of border checkpoints as emergency rooms, but often emergency rooms, hospitals, and other spaces of healthcare in the US are operating as de facto border patrol checkpoints. My entree into this research for my discussion today, although I conducted a 12 months of field work with um, kind of more traditional humanitarian NGOs along the borderlands, uh, organizations like No More Deaths, Humane Borders, the Samaritans. I also conducted field work in kind of semi-underground free clinics across the state of Arizona that provide health care to uh, migrants who are undocumented and uninsured who have virtually no access to health care provision in anywhere else in the, in the U.S. 
The, um, the clinic where I conducted my fieldwork in Phoenix, I call the Community Clinic of Phoenix, or CCP. It began as a collective of street medics who provided water um, and medical attention to uh, protesters who were tear gassed um, during the 2010 protests against the passage of the infamous SB 1070 legislation. Upon the passage of that legislation, the collective of street medics were seen as trusted people in the community who were called upon to conduct home visits um, for uh, you know, kind of medical issues anywhere from a child's fever to uh, diabetes to more serious uh, medical conditions. Um, so this group, some of which had little formal medical training, uh, many of them came together and created a uh, guerrilla clinic, um, a clinic without walls originally, that uh, operated with medical equipment in, out of their trunks, out of backpacks, going door to door, house to house, providing medical care uh, for the migrant community in Phoenix. Eventually, they uh, bought what had been a condemned crack house and renovated it into a clinic space. They have a multi-pronged critique of the kind of health and immigration systems in the U.S. The first one being primarily that they are uh, working to be not a free version of a broken healthcare system. Hmm. Yes, moving quickly. Um, so they critique the kind of for-profit nature of the healthcare system in the US, um, which is basically uh, predicated on, uh, you know, healthcare as a business turning a profit. They also critique the direct collusion in Phoenix between immigration enforcement and health spaces of health. And recounted in my fieldwork there of Sheriff Arpaio who parked immigration vehicles like this outside of emergency rooms, checking people's papers on their way in and out of the ER as a way to really not only discuss the collusion between health and immigration enforcement in Phoenix, but also to mark the real ways that immigration enforcement barred people's access to the only emergency medical care to which they were entitled. Yeah, another way that this um, collusion portrays itself is not so much a direct collusion with immigration enforcement, but health, spaces of health and health officials acting themselves as border patrol agents. And we see one of the activists in my, uh, who was an organizer and a patient at the clinic, talked about the ways that there's, within the community in Phoenix, there's very much a strong knowledge of the hospital as a place you do not go. A place you do not go, you would rather die. Um, and Diego said, we, in my family we say, we like to joke that we'd rather die than go to the hospital because the hospitals are deporting us. This is a picture of St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix, which is one of the most infamous hospitals in the US that is privately deporting immigrant patients. They call these medical repri rep repri uh, repatriations, uh, facility transfers. Um, it's an undocumented practice that happens, uh, extra legal practice that is not under the purview of ICE or of any government oversight. It's basically guised under, under the bureaucracy of facility transfers of patients who have long-term acute traumatic brain injuries, are in a coma, are paralyzed as a result of things like workplace injuries and that sort of thing, who are pressured or uh, in, the, uh, in the cases in which patients are comatose, transferred without their consent to another country. Um, and Mo this happens pervasively across the U.S., but St. Joseph's is most outspoken in admitting that they have a committee that meets monthly to decide on these patients' cases and that they deport hundreds of patients a year. CCP was very much a part of resisting this practice in Phoenix. They had people who were CCP volunteers who also worked at the hospital in their day jobs. And they would alert a network of activists when these deportations were going to happen. They would say, this ambulance, this day, this time. And together, the CCP activists would mount resistance to try to bar these uh, facility transfers from happening. One very high profile case was in 2011 when Jose Gutierrez, who was a 
film engineer in LA was deported in the end of March. Nine days later, he tried to cross back into the US across the Arizona border, and was brutalized by CBP agents to the point that he arrived at the hospital, St. Joseph's, uh, with black eyes, with electrical taser burn marks, and with massive head trauma that necessitated the removal of his skull in five places. Though his wife was, uh, you know, up kind of mounting a case, a legal case on his behalf, uh, there was multiple efforts to deport him. She would leave to go home to shower, come back to find his limbs wrapped in dry ice to transfer him to the helicopter to medevac him back to Mexico. CCP activists mounted a resistance where they positioned a volunteer at every entrance and exit 24 hours a day to the hospital with local press on speed dial so that any effort to move him was thwarted. This is one example of insurgent humanitarianism, but often it's not this dramatic. In many ways, it's the mundane day-to-day -day provision of medical aid for undocumented and uninsured migrants in Arizona that are otherwise unentitled and eligible to receive healthcare otherwise. Insurgent humanitarianism has to do with disrupting dichotomies of deservingness in which only migrants who are good migrants are considered um, you know, eligible or legitimate or justified for receiving any sort of enti entitlements or social services in the US. It has to do with disrupting the benefactor kind of models of charity and emphasizing migrant health justice. And it has ultimately to do with the resistance of collusion between immigration enforcement and health care spaces in the US and the operation of health care spaces as de facto border patrol checkpoints. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Uh, let me quickly introduce myself because I'm not an academic. Um, I used to make documentaries for the French National Radio. I made documentaries on the history of international migrations. And uh, I wanted to talk about bridges that we can build between journalism and academics. We were talking about that earlier. And Adnor and I <laughs> can prove that it works. And uh, we can give you advices if you want later, but just for you to know, I think that you should reverse the problematic and maybe think about doing journalism by yourself, not waiting for journalists to do, to do things because it's long and complicated. So maybe now you can make your own podcast, write your articles and so on, try to find your own audience. It's useful, useful too. But let's talk about that later if you want. Um, so, as I was saying, Anlo and I are working on various projects on borders. First, there is a podcast series on border art, uh, then a documentary series for TV on the history of international migration, uh, international borders. Um, there is also a VR experience on border walls, and last but not least, and this is what we're going to talk uh, about more in more in detail now is the the exhibition on the concept of borders. Um, why do we have so many projects? You could ask, because we think it's important to show the variety and the complexity of the borders, and we try we really want to try to talk to as much people as possible <laughs> everywhere, anywhere, in any kind of media. So, and we are trying to mix um, affect and intellect, I mean, to try to make some pedagogy and, um, and journalism at the same time. I think we can do both at the same time. So, um, let's talk about the, the, the VR experience maybe first. Yeah, so the whole exhibition started first by the VR experience, um, uh, dealing with the fact that, maybe we can go ahead, um, dealing with the fact that um, we uh, want to show, to remember people that borders are our constructions, our conventions, our representations, so that what we know today can be changed and we can try to build new kind of borders. So the idea is that we'd like people to break free from reality. That's why 
VR experience and virtuality is interesting. And in the VR experience, the idea is that they could experience the paradox of walls, the fact that uh, we need walls to be protected, but at the same time, they isolate us from others. And we want people to experience that so that we can avoid this binary visions between good borders, bad borders, <laughs> uh, pro-borders or anti-borders. Let's break free from ideology too and just show that it exists, it, borders do exist, have always existed, but the, what they look like has been changing all the time, so let's break free from what we know and try to imagine what they could look like tomorrow. And that's the reason why um, the, whole, the whole idea of the exhibition, of the VR experience first, but also of the exhibition, is to, maybe, uh, yeah, can you go back? Thank you. Uh, to make people be active in the experience, in the, in the, in the whole exhibition, uh, and to, to, to experience the border and to manipulate borders as ideas and as materials. Um, yeah. We do think that, yeah, that's why it's a collaborative and, and interactive exhibition. Starting, no, it's not starting. The VR experience is the core of the exhibition, but it's not the start. And um, it's a multi-user experience for, let's say, around 40, maybe 50 people at the same time. And um, people are going to be, uh, uh, um, people will be able to see how borders um, have ap appeared on Earth, like scars, let's say and then dividing people, dividing landscapes, and then, okay, and then um, I have to go faster. <laughs> okay, 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 I will, <laughs> promise. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they have to, at the end of the, of the VR experience, people will have the opportunity to imagine borders as hyphens and to create connections with other users, that's the whole idea. And um, we've been in influenced, inspired, let's say, by uh, the U.S.-Mexican border artist and activism, and well, that's all. And the all is for people to to get involved in that topic and to be able to think that they can do something, they can make a change. Okay, let's I will, yeah. I will, I will I will take over and try to run through the presentation. Uh, so uh, we want to. We are building on a feminist scholarship uh, that that is uh, building on every the everyday, uh, building also on um, intersectional approaches of, of of the border, and trying to escape the sensationalism, uh, the politics of pity based on the spectacle. So all these are the good intentions. Then we'll discuss them. So we are also trying to work. Um, on a multi-contextualized uh, notion of the border, uh, working with decentered histories of the representation of the border in the non-occidental worlds. Uh, but that all quest is also, of course, questionable in as much as we are going to do all of this within the walls of the rooms of museums, which are very normative institutions. Thereof, the second part of the presentation uh, concerning the, the paradox of the spectacle and our intent, that is an intent for the moment, to show both the visibility and the invisibility of the border. As many uh, people have said before, uh, the border is both seen and obscene as being seen. <laughs> uh, it's a question of what is visible, what is made invisible, and what is made hyper-visible. And there is a, a huge part of strategic invisibility behind all that is made visible. And I think the core of the work that we're trying to do is to try to convey to, the, to all the audiences this strategic invisibility. Uh, so we won't go to these major works that are uh, upfront or positional uh, and try to, to work in, with younger artists and with all kinds of artifacts that try to, to tackle the border in different ways. And this is, for example, a very interesting piece by a young Mexican artist from Mexicali called Chantal Peñalosa, 
who has been working with students in reenactments of all the work of the Border Arts Workshop, Taller de Arte Fronterizo, El Baftaf, and all the, all the pieces that have been made on this Tijuana San Diego border, but they are doing small models of little pieces, and this is called Unfinished Business Garage, asking of what remains in the landscape of that border of all these artistic ex uh, installations that have been produced there. So, to move forward, um, the interest too of our what we bring, I mean, is, uh, and this is a homage to Bruno Latour who just died, uh, is that we are working, in, we're trying to work with the artists from the point of view of science from my part and from communication and information from Emily's part uh, to work in a way that um, the concept remains central through, and the discussion on a complex issue can be made accessible through all kinds of manipulations, some of them very highly technical, the VR, but we are starting uh, in a very simple way with uh, uh, the first exhibition happening in Mexico. So we are also trying to resist as much as we can, as, as much as we can discuss with the museums that will host us, uh, musealization within a museum. So conclusions, <laughs> uh, we are trying, sorry, to, to contribute to overcoming a the, what um, Chiara Bottici calls the paradox of a world full of images but deprived of imagination. So bring back imagination to the audiences that we will try to touch. Uh, this is not very new, Rousseau in his way uh, was asking that the spectators become an entertainment to themselves, make them actors, uh, so, and do it so that each sees and loves himself in the others, so that we all be better united. That was very political at the time. Uh, the idea is that we do a nomadic show, uh, the f and it's a spice-specific, I'm all, almost done, site-specific meaning that we will mix, and we are mixing the local issues, uh, and uh, the global ones, bringing to, uh, so the first iteration will be in Mexico next fall, then Quebec at the Museo de la Civilisation, and in Mexico it's Museo de, la, de las Culturas del Mundo, and we are looking forward to more co-productions to this uh, endeavor that we are presenting. Thank you very much for your attention. First of all, I, I'm honored to be part of this gender uh, reversal panel. I don't know how I got into it, but uh, somehow I, I made my way. Uh, second, it occurs to me I'm, I'm the last presenter today, and I, I kind of feel, uh, I feel like I'm a kind of border wall that is standing between you and drinks at five o'clock. So if you could bear with me, and maybe, maybe there'll be some transgression here. And then uh, third, my thir third line of introduction, I, th I thought uh, for a moment there that I was going to be at this conference, because it's my first time, I thought I was going to be akin to a kind of antichrist here. Uh, but when I heard Lori Troutman's presentation and now Aaron's presentation, I realized that what I have to say uh, fits in very nicely with some of the things we've actually heard throughout the day. I want to take us on a trip in this presentation to Palestine. It's a long ways away, and what I want to do is I want to make, uh, oh, sorry, I want to make an argument about, let's see what you can see, okay. I want to make an argument about the image you see at the top and the image that you might have some questions about on the bottom, and I want to try and make these two things rough equivalents. This is going to be a very visually oriented presentation, so maybe that's good, because we're, we've uh, heard uh, presentations, we're, we're fatigued, we're, we're looking forward to the drink session later. And so there, there's a lot of things, but unfortunately I don't have a pointer. I'll have to maybe describe a few things to you because you have to look a little bit closely to understand some of the things I want to tell you about. Uh, this presentation does have theory in it. 
Okay, this, but <coughs> I'm going to keep this to a minimum because this is 10 minutes and 10 minutes is a very compressed time. But this theory derives from three major bodies of literature, of course, Michel Foucault, the interplay of power and space. I'm, a, I'm not an historical geographer, so I like this kind of thing. Reviel Netz's idea about lines on landscapes representing impassable kinds of space that have been put on landscapes through power. And finally, the American historical geographer, William Cronin, who's written about how the property rights regime on the American landscape came into being through violence and power. And, okay, back to Palestine, though. I want to begin our story in sort of uh, some time back in the distant past. And I want to first visit what uh, the Palestinian geographer Kamal Abdel Fattah called the quintessential Palestinian agricultural village. Palestinian of, Palestine, of course, is a largely agrarian economy. And the village that you are looking at is one that he considered to be the quintessential agrarian village. And the feature that I want you to notice in this slide is what is at the top of, of this, the, the the agricultural town sort of steps up to a hill. The hill is kept relatively empty. There, are some, there is some cultivation there, but not very much. There are two major historical moments that we have to focus on in this story about the Palestinian landscape. One, of course, is 1948. And I'm, I'm going to go through this in heroic summary. I assume that most of us here are at least somewhat familiar with the story. But there's two dates that we have to keep in mind. 1948, when the State of Israel is created, 750,000 people, Palestinians, are evicted. And I use the word evicted quite deliberately. That's what the former Palestinian foreign minister used when he described the, the process in his book, uh, Scars of War, Wounds of Peace. And the uh, settling of all of those areas that were depopulated, and that's the map on the left. The map on the right represents the other red letter date in Palestinian history, which is 1967, when the state of Israel, through a six day war, takes over the remainder of what was Palestine under the British mandate. And, oops, I didn't, uh, sorry. Okay, here, here it is. <laughs> It's a little bit, uh, okay, so the, the, the okay, the, again, two maps. One, this is 1948, and the, the Israeli villages that were created on the ruins of those Palestinian villages that were destroyed. The map on the right are, is the Israeli settlement project in the Palestinian West Bank, uh, th where it, begins to settle Israeli Jews in those areas. So all of those red dots, I want you to focus on the map on the right, the, the red dots represent Israeli settlements in the conquered territory of the West Bank. The red dots, the, the land, what, what happens to the landscape, that, that sort of quintessential Palestinian landscape, it, it assumes a new form. And the new form is you still have the Palestinian village stepping up to the hill, but on the hilltop now are all of those red dots, and all of those red dots represent these Israeli settlements that have, by and large, taken over the uh, hilltops. Okay. Now, all of those, I, I, we, in order to understand this story, we have to understand something that occurs in 1996 and is renewed called Military Order 378. And what Military Order 378 essentially does is it draws a border around all those red dots and it creates no uh, uh, zones of uh, impassable space. Palestinians are not allowed to go into those areas around the red dots. Those red dots, however, those red dots do not remain static. They are expanding. The Israeli settlement population is expanding all the time, as you can see by this graph. It's expanding almost a hundredfold. The red dots are basically the, 
I, I guess the anchor, but the red dots are, if you can uh, picture this in your mind, the red dots are expanding because the same territorial footprint cannot hold the same number of people. So those red dots are moving outward. That means the areas of impassable space to Palestinians is also expanding all the time. Let me give you an illustration of how this works. On the left in the foreground is the, is the Palestinian town of Nahlin. In the background is the Israeli settlement, quite large, of Bitar Elit. And you can see on the uh, left side of that some empty areas in which this settlement is going to expand. If we fast, okay, fast forward to 2019, picture taken from almost the exact spot, you can see that some of that area has been already filled in. So, and here's sort of a detail of it. You can see here what is effectively a, an area of expanding impassable space. This is the phenomenon that I wanted to get across to you. you what you have on the Palestinian landscape is an area of space that is impassable, that is constantly expanding. This is another way in which this process occurs with an existing settlement setting up trailers on the landscape below where the settlement footprint is, and then eventually those uh, trailers turn into permanent Israeli settlements. I'm going to try to finish up here really quick in about uh, 90 seconds. If you look at this map in the, in the middle, I don't know if you can read it from where you're sitting, there is a town called Arak Burin. And I would like to introduce us to a gentleman farmer who, is, uh, who works as a farmer in Iraq Burin. His name is Izat Q. He's been farming all of his life. If we look at this slide now, if we look at this slide, in the middle of the slide is an area, you can sort of make it out, some of you can make it out. Those are olive trees that belong to Izat. Those are his olive trees. And what has happened to Izat is that those olive trees, the, the, that there was one, let me go back real quick. This, the people from the settlement up top have come down and they have planted grapes in an area that was formerly uh, consisted of his olive trees. So they destroyed some of his olive trees, but his, he still has some remaining trees there. And he cannot go to harvest those olive trees because he is afraid of the violence from the settlers living up top who have effectively colonized that space where his olive trees are. So what I would like to leave us with is this thought. That er th this area here, I wanted to, I, I asked Izad if we could go to that area when I was visiting, one, one of the times I was visiting him. He said, no, we can't go there because if we go into that area to, ha for, to, to his uh, olive trees, the people up on the top there will shoot. They'll shoot at him and so he's afraid to go there. His olive trees have basically been lying there fallow for six years. And I would argue to us that that has effectively become a border wall that he cannot cross, even though it's his property. So what I would like to leave us with is the idea of border walls being something other than something physical, something material. There is impassable space created by this process of colonization, settlement, in which the meaning of a border wall, being the creation of impassable space, is essentially duplicated without the benefit of a wall. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to all four presenters. Uh, so, as with previous panels, we were opening the floor to discussion. So, I'm, I will invite you to come front to the microphone to ask your questions. 
And as you make your way to the front uh, for your questions, maybe I can uh, start off with um, questions for every panelist, if I may, as people make their way. Um, so maybe starting with uh, Brenda, I was wondering, because um, you talked specifically about the region in El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, um, and there has been some instances of art and activism along the US-Mexico border as a whole, uh, especially in Tijuana, where there's a mural that is very organized in terms of uh, activism. And I was wondering if in the region that you're studying, is it more spontaneous uh, forms of artwork or are there organized uh, groups or organized form of activism? Um, yes, there are some similarities, but they are very different borders. Uh, in Juarez, there are a lot of activism that is invisible is ephemer, ephemeral, and for, for example, all this image I present you, they, they don't no longer exist. And they are always changing because they are uh, kind of illegal. The canal cannot be um, uh, appropriated on the side of the United States. It's, it's like a federal law, do you go to jail if you go there? And even if you have permission, the um, uh, patrol, the, border. the border patrol, uh, don't allow it, even if you have a uh, permit. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I remember I, I was living in El Paso while there was the, um, the cross-border light installation. And it's actually interesting because the, uh, the artist uh, lives in Montreal, Canada. So the, the links between the two were uh, quite interesting. And even that was, I think it was there for a month or so, and then it was gone. Yeah, it's not trace at all of it, it even existed. It only in photographs. And it, it was quite big, so it's interesting that it's yes, actually it no longer. Yes, it was all the chamisal, that is um, uh, 20 hectares. I don't know how to say it. But it's a lot of land. It's an urban park, the only one that we have. And it was all the border in there, full of lights, and the installation the technological um, system was there for a month. Yeah. So it's interesting to see how the border, even in terms of activism, is different from place to place. And the city, because uh, the city is together. The sister cities, uh, you cross the, um, the bridge. It's crossing like um, a street, and it's the other side. And there are people in there. We say hello. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I see that we have some questions. Um, so uh, if you can ask your question one and then after the other, and then we yep. can um, answer them. Thank you. Okay. So I have two questions. One is a little bit to follow up on that set of questions you were asking about the border art. So it is for Brenda. Brenda, could you say a little bit more about the relationship between kind of resistance and counter resistance? Um, expressed in both the creation of the art and the destruction of the art as well. So the relationship between art on the one hand and resistance on the one hand and counter resistance and vandalism of art and sort of where art bleeds into vandalism and vice versa. So I would like to have you say even a little bit more about the um, resistance and counter resistance around that mode of expression. And then the other thing I wanted to ask about um, Aaron, Aaron, your presentation, and I really appreciated it because what you're finding on a very local level is something that we've started to be able to detect in our kind of global macro data, and that is where you have very hard borders, especially where there are border walls, fences, and where there are no visa waivers permitted, that the infant mortality rates on each side in the border region have tremendous amounts of discontinuity. So, you know, you might have infant mortality rates that are like this for kind of a region, and if there's a hardened border in between them, you get infant mortality rates that are like this. And I think your paper is really um, an interesting way to think about those mechanisms, the mechanisms of denial of basic health care, the inability to access something that might be life-saving and near, but you cannot because of the hardening of the borders. So I really appreciated your presentation. It got me to think a little bit more about what is producing what we're finding at a very global level and very macro kind of a level through some of the mechanisms that you've presented here. Thanks. 
So maybe we can take those two questions and then uh, the next one. Uh, okay. Um, resistance and counter resistance. I think in studying borders and the borderland is constantly in a formal rebellion of resistance of itself. One country is resistant to another one, constantly. And in the Mexico and United States, because of the asymmetry of a lot of things, we, um, we like the border people, are always having these strategies. And art, I think, the activism and art activism, they are two things. When the activism takes the art for both, uh, for make to translate a message or to make a protest, and that's when the maybe the resistance um, can be translated to counter the system. I think, in my personal opinion, uh, I I see it um, like together in the border art. It's it's. You can see it uh, like a form of vandalism. Many people see it that way. And other people like me take it as like a very important documentation of what is happening there because it's not a known place. It's a very symbolic place. And, ex and it uh, exists for the vociferation and the transnational messages that um, what is people and what is artists have to make, have to make. Thank you. Thank you for your question and your feedback. Um, in terms of infant mortality, there was my research collaborator, Lisa Soonhee Park, is at Santa Barbara. Um, and she has a book called Entitled to Nothing, which looks at a California practice in I believe the early 2000s in which um, as migrant women of childbearing age were entering back in the, into the United States, they were interrogated by Border Patrol about if they had used prenatal care under Medicaid to which they were entitled. Um, and then if they had, they were basically requested uh, quite forcefully to repay that money on demand in order to enter the US um, or face deportation back to the country that they had just been in, basically. Um, and so she looks at this in her book. And so this is quite clearly, I think, right, the link between what was an entitled healthcare, um, a healthcare entitlement to uh, women in the US, migrant women in the US, and how some of this increased collaboration between kind of like things about thoughts around public charge, women as public charge charges or somehow burdens on collective resources, um, and the ways that their kind of denial of this entitlement um, is mirrored much largely in kind of the wholesale uh, denial of healthcare access and provision to um, migrants who are undocumented in the US. And so certainly the hardened borders, um, people who can travel to Mexico, US citizens and Mexican nationals uh, from Air like in Arizona do travel for healthcare uh, across the border in Mexico. Um, but yes, as you're saying, as, this, as these borders become more hardened, that kind of cyclical medical migration um, is not happening, right? And so there's a, a whole kind of, uh, what, I, what my research collaborators and I call kind of like a third net of healthcare in the US, um, kind of a, a safety net below the safety net of really informal, underground, sometimes clandestine spaces of healthcare um, that are doing the best they can with the patchwork of services they can provide, but it's a very much an inadequate system. Thank you, so we have another question. Uh, thank you very much for this panel that is twisting in different direction the security narrative of borders. It's uh, appreciable. I have two questions, one for uh, Odemilia Nanor and one for Erin. For Odemilia Nanor, you mentioned, of course, that your project is trying to subvert the museification of uh, border art, basically. So my curiosity question is how did you convince museums in Mexico and in Quebec to embark into that? How would you control that it would not be too much 
museified, if I can say so. And for Erin, my question is more about the politicization of humanitarianism. Arizona was, during the last election campaign, quite a strong uh, place for movements of uh, defense of Latino rights, of migrant rights, trying to uh, do a get the vote operation, if I follow that well from afar, from Paris. Uh, so I want to know if the humanitarian actors that you are following are also thinking about this advocacy work. How do they reach out, especially probably to the Democratic Party? Is it part of their strategy also? And more generally, how do you see the politicization of these kind of groups in Arizona, but more generally? Thank you for this question. First, I would say that coming from France, it's much easier for us to present such uh, uh, an exhibition project in the Americas, let's say. Um, uh, yeah, it was much easier for us to to sell the idea of working on borders in the museum here, since the idea of museum and the reality of museums are pretty different from what we know in Europe. Um, and I must say that the, the museum, the Musée de la Civilisation, Museum of, this, of Civilization is kept in Quebec, has been the very first one to accept <laughs> to, <laughs> to get into this uh, ambitious project. And um, yeah, we are lucky enough here today to have uh, one of his, uh, its represent, uh, re representative, representant here, Luc, if you are here. <laughs> uh, so um, thank you for, for your confidence. And um, yeah, for us, it was much more easy, easier here because um, on that continent, museums usually, most museums, uh, most museums are, um, participative museums, they, they really collaborate with local communities, with people. It's, not, it's, it's definitely not the way we, we in France and in Europe think about you know, bringing culture to people. It's, here it's more something that we co-create, uh, co-create exhibitions and, and uh, associate people from the beginning to the end. And this is something we have also discovered when we went, Anlo and I, in residency in California uh, six months ago. And we uh, were lucky enough to, 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 to discover many different kinds of, of, of museums. M many of them were having uh, exhibitions on, on the border because obviously that's a topic. <laughs> and they do embrace that topic, which is brave. Um, and, um, and they do it in a way which is pretty different from what we would do in Europe. Obviously, they are much more open-minded and ready to, to break free from conventions too. So uh, this is exactly the way we, we, want it in, we want to work, so it works. <laughs> so it's in 10 minutes, we didn't have time to go into, into details. And I will just add that for the Museo de las Culturas del Mundo in, in Mexico, it's also an opportunity to shift to more conceptual uh, exhibitions from a more ethnographic and regional way of seeing cultures. So it also works with this concept of border culture that we've been writing together with, on with, uh, with Victor Conrad. So it's against musification as a uh, something that is top down, but not against musification that would be uh, more, more participative in, in many ways. Uh, well, you, you, we will all be able to judge on the results because for the moment it's very um, programmatic and we'll see if we manage to do something different. It's also a way of saying that um, uh, we don't, I mean, I don't believe as much in art as being um, counterpower as I did in the beginning when I started to study border art. Therefore, the workshops uh, the different tools that we, simple, high-tech and low-tech that we want to use, the games, a lot of games, a lot of work with schools, questionnaires, uh, sketching maps and, and the rest, in order that, yeah, the, the, muse, the exhibition is also uh, a continuously um, changing, evolving project over the scale of the, uh, of the moment it is shown, and then we'll see what happens after that. Thank you for your question. I, uh, um, 
certainly have thought a lot about the politicization of humanitarianism as well as the outright criminalization of it, right? We think about not only the U.S.-Mexico border, but the criminalization of humanitarian aid in the Mediterranean. Um, and so certainly uh, activists that I worked with, humanitarian activists that I worked with during my field work were subsequently arrested and tried under the Trump administration, albeit a, a eventually acquitted. So certainly the um, humanitarianism is, uh, you know, operates in spaces of really contentious politics and so has to always contend with the ways that humanitarianism is politicized. Um, I talked more in my uh, presentation today about the humanitarianism as a field of action, not so much the discourse, but the discursive piece of humanitarianism, it, the way it's wielded discursively is very important as a way to push back against some of that politicization. So in my research, I see organizations working, operating in kind of that orange perimeter of border patrol jurisdiction really deploy humanitarianism as almost like an apolitical discourse, right, to legitimate the work they're doing in a more contentious area. Um, whereas the medical humanitarian NGOs, more internal to the country, um, were able to wield humanitarianism in a more, pol like a more politicized indictment um, of really trying to draw attention to the, the necroviolence across the interior of the U.S. that is often not as seen as the real stark relief of necroviolence in the borderlands. Thank you. So do we have other questions for our participants? If not, I have a list of questions so I can, I can ask them while you think about your questions. Um, so if I can build on uh, maybe what uh, you were saying earlier and uh, about building those bridges and putting together this uh, this work that is that has many components, uh, which I I think it may comes with some challenges. So were there some challenges that you faced uh, coming from two different fields and also working with a third field in terms of museums uh, that adds to the academic part and the journalism part, uh, or was it smooth sailing and without any challenges? Well, I would say it's been it's been pretty easy because I'm graduate, graduated in uh, in sociology too. So I'm not an academic as you are, but I used to work in the in the in the humanities too. So we can understand each other quite easily. And and Anlo had already the willing the will to to make an exhibition on border art before I knew her. So we were. It was a match, <laughs> and it was very easy, yeah. We, we still have, the, the issue is that we, we don't agree all the time, that makes another new project, so we <laughs> It's quite interesting, actually. Uh, it's quite kind of a gender issue. I've been on a very, and a lot of collectives that were less feminist and feminine. <laughs> and uh, this time, we, I mean, we do agree, we do not agree on everything and we do argue, but in general, it comes out to, into, yeah, solving th things and proposing other stuff, especially on the role of border art, because there, there may be, a, one of the options is also to build a real retrospective of border art that would go to contemporary art museums, but this is not the first one on the list. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question for Gary. As I was listening to you, and I really appreciated your, uh, your presentation, I was wondering if in between the spaces with walls and those you're studying without walls, is there not a third one? It's really a question that came up to my mind, what, which is about when border walls fall and what's left behind would be pretty much like the second um, space you were looking at, like when, border, when, when the Berlin Wall fell, there was something about that border being still under, uh, underlined, still existing. So, you know, when, when, the, when the, the if, but when, the, the wall between Israel and the West Bank uh, fall, will we see something that is still a wall, but a non-existing one? Like, could it be Something that teaches us that? Or not? <laughs> Thanks for that. 
for that question. Uh, I never like to predict the future, so it, it's very difficult. But I guess what you're what you're trying to uh, get at is what, what, how can we conceive of the space kind of in between both a physical wall and a wall that I tried to argue is built with, not with uh, wires or bricks or some material, uh, something of materiality, but something that is enforced through power, through through force and through unequal force on both sides of that wall. And I, I, I'm not sure how to answer your question, but I, I guess what I, was, what I was trying to impress upon this group with my, with my talk was the fact that in Palestine you have both phenomena operating simultaneously. I mean, the state of Israel is one of the master builders of walls, for sure, the, that in the material sense. But they have also uh, figured out a, a, a system by which uh, Palestinians, Palestinian circulation across the landscape is being constantly shrunk. It, it's getting smaller and smaller. And the, the, the kind of regime that's emerging on this space is what I argue is a kind of confinement regime. Because confinement means you can't I mean, here's, here's a space, the space has, has boundaries, and the boundaries, whether they're made by the wall, like I, one of the walls I showed in Jerusalem and Abu Dis, th that's one kind of wall, but there are many different kinds of, of uh, impassable spaces that are created uh, independent of something material. And the the state of Israel has become masters at both of these crafts. They, they really ha have mastered it. And the, what, what is occurring as these settlements keep expanding is that the, sh the space for Palestinians in which to reside, uh, work, and circulate is shrinking every day, really by every, every single day. This, these spaces for Palestinians are getting smaller every single day. And so there's a, a way in which I want to understand the, the phenomenon of border walls as the creators or the, the instrumentality of impassable space and walls that are created in a, in, a, in a different fashion but have the same impacts in the final analysis, that th th this idea of, of immobility. The, if, uh, you know, it just uh, the, uh, the inability to move from point A to point B, uh, whether there's a wall there or whether there's not a wall there, there are ways of, of restricting it. I think we have two other questions. So maybe, again, we can take both uh, questions and after uh, answer them. Okay. Um, uh, first, I wanted to thank Erica for her a vibrant presentation and I was just curious how big is that organization like how many people are involved approximately and um, my other question is for the the presentations that were more traditionally focused on art and I thought I'd bring forward a conversation from this morning um, by I think Vias Rodriguez who spoke about the VR exhibition and said you know, the problem with what I saw is structure, like no structural explanations. And I was wondering, uh, I wanted to ask you guys that question about how you use VR and if you thought that critique did or did not apply to your own work. And um, finally, I wanted to uh, address, I believe, Ortiz over there, and I believe you used the word artivism in your presentation, yeah. and. Um, one of your final slides was um, um, something created by Ronald Rayle and his partner, Virginia Fratello. And some people kind of critique that work and don't see it as artivism, but actually highly problematic. So I wanted to ask you guys for a bit more interpretation and, and communication about the ethics of the art and the artivism. Thank you. We can take the other question and then you can answer that. Uh, thank you to you all. This was a really interesting panel to learn from, and also I really appreciated the wonderful use of images throughout. 
A uh, question for uh, Brenda, I was just curious, the, you showed us many of these themes coming from the artwork and there was a lot of overlap, you know, but kind of between these different pieces. I wondered if there are any that stand out to you as particularly unique or communicating a different kind of messages from the rest, um, just kind of a standout example. And uh, for Gary, I was interested in your previous uh, question answer got into this a little bit, um, but what other types of barriers do you see as similar to walls in disallowing movement in this way? And you gave us this uh, very clear example of the olive trees, but I'm interested in other examples you've seen of these type of impassable spaces, whether it's uh, in the case study area that you presented or in other uh, things that you've learned over the years. Thank you. Thank you for all those great questions. So if it works with you, we can maybe go from right to left uh, in answering the questions that were asked. Okay. Concerning the VR experience, I would say that since the beginning when I've written the scenario, I, I've always wanted it to be hosted in a, an exhibition because I wanted people to understand what's happening uh, on borders and not only to feel or to experiment. I think it's important to have both. <laughs> uh, so to take time, and it, we need time because this is a very sensitive topic and complicated topic. So uh, it's important to have time and space for explaining uh, the history of international borders and explaining uh, how we live on a daily basis with borders, with any kind of borders, so that uh, almost at the end of the exhibition, we could put the mask and try to, um, try to invent something else. So uh, it was very important for me since the beginning that both would work together. And plus, uh, this is a multi-users experience and its, its aim is, is, um, is to encourage, encourage people to get linked, to get connected at the end, and then to create something first in the VR experience, but also after in the exhibition, in the last part of the, of the exhibition, they're gonna be asked to do something, to create something in reality. So we hope, but we're gonna see, I mean, <laughs> this, maybe this is just wishful thinking, but we hope that it's gonna change something. And, um, um, but we have to try. <laughs> we'll tell you if it works or not, but we hope so. <laughs> and just to add a small detail, we're working with a producer, Chloe Jarry from Lucid Realities, whose work is acknowledged for um, the way she manages to put the VR really at the heart of artistic exhibitions or of uh, documentary exhibitions. And generally people don't do the VR at the beginning and then have the exhibition or at the end and leave. It's in the middle and then generally when they, when, and they, for example, she did a, one very successful one uh, with a Monet exhibit and in, the, in a very traditional museum in France, and the curators were very doubtful, and they were, very, and they were quite surprised that after having seen the VR, the people would go through the, the, the real paintings again, instead of, so there, there's a, there, there, she, this is something we're working on, then there will be lots of critiques, and that's for the next conferences. <laughs> Thank you for those great questions. Briefly, just to speak to the size of the organization, um, the collective of street medics was only, was quite small, but it um, grew to about 25, 30 people at the height of the SB 1070 protests. Um, but now the volunteer base for the clinic is quite large into the hundreds, um, as and they provide regular care to about 500 patients in the Phoenix area. Um, the interesting part about the organization and the volunteers there is that it's a mix of kind of health modalities that are often seen in conflict or uh, tension with one another. So they have a lot of kind of more traditional Western medicine, kind of like uh, allopathic or biomedical approaches to health. Um, and 
as well as naturopathic approaches to health. So, uh, and then there's a number of uh, curanderas who also volunteer there, right? So there's like this level of um, different modalities working together um, to write, provide care for the patients, which kind of interacts in really interesting ways, not without their own tensions. Thank you also for the questions. Um, okay, um, artivism. Artivism in Juarez and it takes artivism uh, take the streets, take the city as a canvas. Artivism in the border takes the border itself, the line and the surroundings as the place for the action. And it's a conscious action that the artists take to vociferate uh, to uh, to take the message across the border. And it's, uh, um, I think uh, the difference between um, if it's an activism or, or not, artivism um, depends on the artists that make it, depends on the interpretation that is take place, uh, but it also, has to has to make um adios perdón estoy tratando de traducir um when a, when an artist make an action on the border uh, it globalizes if it's taken on the mass media yeah uh, a lot of the action in the Juarez border are like um taken a statement uh, of what the border is, but it doesn't mm, sometimes make sense. Um, the pop art that was made uh, was uh, the Totter, the Subi Baja, take, uh, the yeah. um, take five minutes. And it was like, take the pieces, put it there, take a video, and take it away. Yeah, I know it but the impact was made by the video and by the photos, not by the action. It was made uh, for the translator, the translation that we make uh, for the border, that the wall can be something else. And it, in, 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 I don't know, it, it's not a critique on the work of the artist, but of the action that take place at the border and the frontier line, and how we can um, replace some imaginary thoughts of Juarez, uh, like the horror house of Juarez, of the city, the most violent city of Mexico, and all that. No, and it can be another thing, and that the, that's why I presented here, and I will present in my work. But it's not a critique of the work itself, but of the action, like artivism. Um, yeah. And what is the most symbolic piece for me? The murals on the canal are always very symbolic because they share the message uh, of the migrant people, of, of the urban artists that are transnational workers. And they are voices that are, cannot be replaced by another things and they, they, they last a month maybe in there and there is by another so thank you I think your question was about other examples of walls or impassable spaces and, and maybe I'll keep on the subject of the Palestinian West Bank if that's okay um, for I, I think above all the the constant expansion of the settlements themselves are akin to walls because what happens as these settlements expand territorially across the landscape is they create more and more impassable space. So all of those red dots on the map and the, set, the, the territorial footprint occupied by settlements effectively creates a landscape of walls multiplied by 150, there are roughly 150 settlements, we'll say. So there's 
walls all over the landscape in the form of settlements. Those settlements, in turn, get connected up by roads. And we, we tend to think of roads as uh, lines that connect two points, or two or more points. But in this particular instance, those connections act as disconnections for Palestinian communities living in between, and uh, it's, it's hard to describe without the cartographic thing right in front of me, but take my word for it, roads in this, in this particular instance act as barriers disconnecting Palestinian towns from one another, and there's often no way for Palestinians to traverse those, uh, those roadways. Uh, the, the, I mean, the other one, another one that's very obvious that acts as a, as a uh, instrument of impassable space, at least on the, in the Palestinian context, that is, is the uh, checkpoint, and which have the, the checkpoint system itself in, in the West Bank has morphed into a, a much more regularized and systematized system of controlling and regulating the movement of all Palestinians across distance. And there's, there's something like five or six major checkpoints. And then in between are a series of uh, sometimes a couple hundred checkpoints that regulate movement between other spaces. So th there's ways Oh, and, and oh, one, one, one thing that we wouldn't think of as a barrier, but it, it really is a barrier, is the ID card itself. The Palestinian, of course, Palestinians are issued an ID card by the State of Israel. It, and on the ID card, it says Jewish or non-Jewish. The Palestinians have the non-Jewish ID card, and that ID card denoting a certain religious affiliation basically controls where you can move throughout the space. So that's, that's, not a, that's not a physical barrier per se, but these are backed up by legal and institutionalized kinds of rules and regulations that are in a, they're something akin to barriers. They're, they're something akin to the making of spaces that become impassable. Non, they cannot circulate. And then finally, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll mention one. It, there, there are what, what Foucault would describe as the, the barriers inside institutions that prevent entry and exit from certain institutional settings. And what he, was, what he was speaking about when he talked about this was mainly things like hospitals, schools. But in the context of Israel, there are barriers. For instance, there are, there are barriers into, into all of the industries inside the state of Israel. That is not the West Bank. But there are barriers into certain what are called critical infrastructure type industries. So. Someone with the name, even, even with an Israeli citizen with the name of Saeed or Mohammed, is not going to get employed in those kinds of industries, water, electricity, all the, 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 the critical basic physical infrastructure industries. They will never get employed in those industries. So that's, we can think of that as a kind of barrier to entry into the institution of those businesses that control vital infrastructural services. So that, that again, is, is a, it's a kind of a wall when you think of it. It's an institutional wall in, 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 the, in the way that Foucault was trying to describe the way in which institutions control the, the movement of bodies and spaces. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a highly theoretical way of looking at it. But there, there are uh, uh, many, many, div I, I think tomorrow we're going to have a panel specifically about this, and we'll learn more about this. But these are just some examples, I think, of what you were trying to get at. Thank you. So we have two questions. Uh, maybe, again, we can take them both uh, and have yeah. the answers after. Uh, I, I would I love to ask a question to all of you because I really enjoyed the, the <laughs> papers. But I think that some people are going to get mad at me because we have those drinks who are waiting for us and <laughs> kind of sense the tension here now. So I'm going to keep it short. And I just have a question for the last presentation. 
I was uh, wondering whether these uh, impossible, yeah, for you, these impossible spaces that you described in your presentation uh, relate to um, like buffer zones, uh, which are sometimes also described as horizontal uh, barriers, because buffer zones are those empty spaces which make the attempts to cross highly visible, and therefore the people who want to cross vulnerable have been used in various contexts uh, through history. And just wanted to know whether there are some specific properties in what you described that differentiate this from a classic buffer zone, or whether it's more or less the same thing. Thank you. Yeah. Since uh, Ronald Rael has been mentioned with his pink seesaws, and since he was here in that venue and presented the first um, the, I don't know if you remember, was it 2014, 13, something like this. So, Ronald was here, and we see the pink seesaws as a, a theater and a mise-en-scene, but you have, like, you have to see that as almost a 10-year work um, done by Ronald Rael, and it was really designed to rethink in the, the border wall as a manifesto, to rethink the border wall and see if we cannot get rid of it, how do we make it futile or disappear? So I, I really, I think we need to keep that in mind when we just look at the pink seesaws, uh, which is really, uh, and of course was a mise-en-scene and a theater, but that's what the border is about. And we were there in El Paso when he was there, so we can, we, we can tell you, like it, it's, it was really the, it's the tip of the icebergs, iceberg, but what's below it is really thick and much more than just a, a political stunt, I think. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. So we had one question for Gary. Oh, okay. Buffer zones. I think that, yeah, that, I, I didn't use that expression, but I think it's, it, it probably is a good concept. And if we, if we think of the last example I was trying to make with Izat and the the settlement up on the hill, what, what, they, what all these settlements are doing with this impassable space is they're creating zones of uh, no, no trespass into, this, into an, a certain area. This, these are effectively buffer zones because the, the, the area of no, uh, of impassable space is not the line of the, the boundary, the territorial footprint of the settlement itself. It's the area, it's a perimeter around the settlement. In other words, it's, um, and it's usually about something like 400 meters. So you don't approach any Israeli settlement if you are Palestinian within 400 meters. Now, what, what I was trying to emphasize is that those buffer zones, though, are constantly moving. They are constantly on the move because the settlements themselves are growing in population and they are occupying a greater and greater territorial footprint by the day, every day. This is, is going on every day. So the, the boundary is moving, the buffer zone is moving. And the uh, settlers themselves are uh, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're the ones who are kind of policing the boundaries along with the Israeli military, but they are intent on enlarging, enlarging that buffer zone around the settlement. So they, they begin to creep, I mean they're expanding across, they begin to creep down the hill. And I, I, was, I wasn't able to explain this really well because that 10 minutes went by so quickly, but they begin to creep down the hill they, they sort of effectively colonize a certain portion of the hill that is not theirs, that, is, that belongs to the Palestinian town, invariably in, in close proximity. And they take over that area, and in this particular case, they, they take over that area, they uproot some of the olive trees that belong to Izat, and they plant a field of grapes. With, there was a white building, I forgot to describe this, but that was a winery. And so the buffer zone for the settlement moves down the hill. It's moving down the hill. And the buffer zone doesn't become the border at the vineyard, between the vineyard and, the, and Izat's olive trees. Izat is effectively 
precluded from going to his olive tree. So the, boor, the buffer zone, and it's, it's a good, I like your concept, the buffer zone has moved a couple hundred meters, and so he can't, he can't access his olive trees, and he hasn't been able to access them for the last six years. I, I, I first went there in, in 2012, I went back in 2014, and I was back again in 2019, and every time I asked, can we go to your olive trees? He said, no, we can't go to the, to the olive trees because we're going we're gonna to get shot at. And so the, 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 there's violence, or just the threat of violence creates a buffer zone that he, in which he cannot access what effectively belongs to him. Thank you very much for all of your presentation. I think it was really interesting to see how people uh, inhabit borderlands, but also how they resist through art, through humanitarianism, and through simply being there. Uh, so I really enjoyed this panel, and I hope you uh, enjoyed it as well. Before uh, we let you go, so we just going to applaud our presenters, but please do not move after. <laughs> So before we let you go in the other room for the cocktail, uh, I think this panel is a great way to uh, highlight two um, exhibits that we have the pleasure of hosting as part of this conference this year. Uh, so the first one is in this room, so I'm going to uh, leave Elizabeth to tell you more about it. Okay, so we thought we'd take a minute to have Pamela Dodds uh, introduce us to the work she's been doing and you've been seeing at the back. So I'm going to give her the mic for a few minutes so that she can explain what, um, you know, that we've got every year either a performance or an artist. So you've got, we've got an artist here. And uh, so I'll let Pamela introduce her work. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Uh, okay, so um, Elizabeth had, has asked me to speak a little bit about my artwork. Uh, and so this is impromptu. Uh, this is totally impromptu. I do not have a prepared uh, remarks for you, but it's okay. Uh, like you, I'm, I've had a wonderful long day and my brain is a little tired. Um, however, I can tell you a bit about this artwork, uh, which I began around 2020. Uh, I am an independent visual artist. I've been making uh, art my whole life. And um, I uh, have mostly made artwork in different media having to do with uh, interpersonal relationships and barriers within our um, ability or failure to come together across differences. And uh, this has kind of morphed into an interest in speaking a little more politically about barriers. The initial inspiration for this work was uh, an opportunity I had to, and this is so appropriate for me to be speaking at the end of this panel, talking about art, but also talking about Palestine, because I did have the opportunity to visit Palestine in 2019 and at the invitation of a Canadian uh, Palestinian artist. And so I uh, learned a great deal about uh, what Gary was talking about and um, the wall and all of the things that are going on there, which should be common knowledge, but somehow we don't know about it. Uh, after that, I had the opportunity to go to an artist residency in Spain, and I was talking about this. And the other artist I was speaking to said, well, you know, Spain has a wall. And I was like, Spain is pretty much surrounded by water. Uh, so yes, I didn't know that Spain had two territories in the north of Africa, which are completely surrounded by very menacing high fences and wires. So this intrigued me, and I thought, well, where else are there walls? And of course, in 2015, so many new walls were being built. So I thought, I really want to explore this artistically. The work is made in uh, the dry point etching technique, and I've, it's a little complicated, 
So I've uh, made a little um, brochure for you to, if you want to read about it, it's in French and English. Uh, basically, the drawings are scratched into a plate and inked and then printed on a manual printing press. And it's quite <laughs> laborious. Uh, sometimes I think, well, you know, so much labor is put into building these walls and fences, and it's a creative endeavor. How sad that this is actually where that creative effort is going. So I find a parallel between my own work, not to mention that I'm scratching uh, the surface of the plate, which to me is reminiscent of the scratching of the barbed wires uh, that people encounter. Uh, I've relied almost entirely on the internet for information about this work. The imagery, I collect as many images as I can. I have to credit the uh, researchers such as yourselves and the documentary photogra photographers who are able to take these photographs to help, which help me. And um, I've made an effort to begin to document uh, all of these walls, but now I see they just have 136, it's getting a little overwhelming. Uh, so just to give you a little introduction, I hope that if you have any questions about the work, please tell me. I'm interested in learning about more walls, and it's an ongoing project of creating imagery and detailed information about uh, walls and barriers in the world. And uh, I, yes, I want your critique, I want your feedback, and also I want more information. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for listening. Since the figure has come up a few times, 136 walls are what we have in our database, like all the walls that have been mentioned since 1945, but not all of them have been built. I want to make sure you go away with the right data. We have 77 confirmed walls, and probably 96 that we think maybe are in the midst of being built, or you know, you've got the first layer, or what have you. So that's the figures we play around with. I will. Let Andrean, because she has been the great architect, and the, the reason why we're talking is because the drinks are not served yet. So <laughs> do not think you're missing out anything you are not. We are making you, you know, wait a little bit longer. Uh, she's the one who made um, hostile terrain, the, the exhibit on the other side, um, real in Montreal. She's been working very hard, so she will be the one. She's the one who deserves to be talking about it. Thank you. Um, so a few months ago, I think over a year ago, I had the pleasure of being part of a conference by uh, Jason De Leon, who some of you may know uh, is uh, working at the UC, uh, University of California in Los Angeles. And as part of his work, he put together this exhibit that you're going to see on the, uh, other, in the other room and you've probably seen it uh, throughout the day, uh, which is called A Style Terrain. And basically, it's an interactive exhibit where um, every person that has been found deceased in the Arizonan desert uh, is identified with a toe tag, uh, which is used in um, when people are, are deceased in, um, I don't know the word in English, but in the morgue, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, so every toe tag that you see on the board has to be filled by end, and we have these lists uh, with the information that we fill out. And as we uh, fill out the tags and put them on the, uh, the map, it actually creates the map of where the people have been uh, found, but also it uh, gives back the names of those people because oftentimes we're going to hear about how many people have been found or what the numbers are, but not, in, not enough do we hear about who they were, what their stories were uh, about. And so he put together this exhibit and basically people could apply to host the, the exhibit. And the period to apply was closed, but I decided to 
email him directly and ask if we could have uh, a style theorem in Montreal, which he agreed uh, to. So this is why we have the pleasure of hosting uh, this exhibit in Montreal. I believe the University of Victoria, where Emmanuel brunet jaillet is, uh, is also a hosting partner or has been a hosting partner, and uh, Leadbridge in Alberta. And those are the three uh, hosting partners in Canada at the moment. Uh, so we invite you to fill out a tag that will be put on the board. And another aspect that is interesting about this work is when you look at the, the tags and the, the, the shape that they form, it's actually almost similar to the form of Mexico that is put on the US-Mexico border. So that is another aspect that is interesting uh, about the exhibit. So please uh, participate in this exhibit. If you want, you can also uh, put a little note on the back of the toe tag if you want to share a thought about what this exhibit makes you feel, um, please feel free to do so. So thank you very much, and we're very happy to have also this component to the, uh, the conference. We have this uh, artistic component to the conference for quite a few editions right now. It's always a pleasure to see how these discussions are not just uh, in terms of papers or in terms of research, but how we can also make them really tangible and uh, in an art form or other. So, Without further ado, I won't stay <laughs> in your way of your drinks. Uh, so we invite you to uh, come and um, check this, uh, the exhibit here, the exhibit on the other side. There's also the poster session. So for people presenting uh, with their poster, if they are not up, we invite you to put them up. And then we invite everyone to go and listen to their presentation as well with a drink on your end. Thank you. Thank you.